right, everybody, really important topic here today. We're gonna to be understanding and going over the intricacies of bloating caused by imbalanced hormones, we call it hormonal bloating, the seven main causes and the specific symptoms associated with them. So this is extremely important. It is female hormone based, but this is really important for men and women to tune into so you have a better understanding, you're able to help your significant other, other and loved one. And honestly, once you know, you know what to look for. It's no longer a mystery. You understand the root cause. And then next week, I will go over the actual, I don't want to say treatments because we don't provide medical advice, right? But we'll go over the actual protocols you can use in order to rebalance those hormones naturally and eliminate the hormonal bloating. Let's dive right in. We always need to know the root cause first. That's what we're talking about right now with the seven specific causes. The first one is this. We have to understand that during a female's menstrual cycle, so let's just say from ages, you, I'm not even going to give the ages because people will say, well, my uh, menstrual cycle lasted until this long, but let's say for about 35 years or so of a woman's life, she may have a menstrual cycle. It could be from 15 years old to 50 years old, could be from 10 years old to 45 years old or so, and it varies based on the individual. There's no right or wrong amount of time, but when a woman does have her menstrual cycle, we have to understand that it, there is two main phases. There's the first 14 days, we'll call it, just for simplicity's sake, that's called the follicular phase. The second 14 days, it's the luteal phase. Now, some women's cycle isn't 28 days. It might be 30 days. It might be 31. It might be 27. But we're going to use a 28-day cycle today. Now, the middle of that cycle is the ovulatory period. A little bit different. So estrogen's rising the first half. Progesterone is rising the second half. I'm just going with foundational-based knowledge here today. Really important to look at it in that regard. The middle of it, we're looking at an increase in luteinizing hormone, follicular, st follicular stimulating hormone. Now, what happens, though, is that the hormones drop rapidly at the end of a woman's cycle. So what we have is an increase in progesterone around, around days 19, 20, 21, more of a peak at that time. And when there is that peak, we can start, a woman can start to feel more water retention and lead to more bloating. As the hormones drop as well towards the end of the cycle, you can get an increase in inflammation, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. So we have to understand the phases that at day zero, we'll call it of first day of menstruation, hormones are low, but estrogen is starting to rise. Okay. So if you have symptoms during this time, you could say, oh, it's because I have low estrogen and low progesterone right now. Now, many women, not all, but many women feel pretty good. Days, let's call it three through 15, 16, 17, 18. And then they start to have symptoms around days 19, 20, 21, and maybe through the end of their cycle, the last five to seven days or so. And oftentimes, it is actually because progesterone didn't rise and estrogen stayed a little bit higher, causing more inflammation, more sodium and water-based retention. And because of that, they feel a little bit more bloated. So what we have during that luteal phase when progesterone is rising around peaking around days, let's say 19, 20, 21, which is typically when women run that stress mood and metabolism test to actually look for estrogen dominance, you might see that progesterone didn't climb. And because of that, you get all of those symptoms of the lower mood, irritability, poor sleep, sometimes night sweats, uh, sometimes a little bit more oily skin or adult acne during that time and bloating that we're talking about here today. So it's important to look at that is that progesterone may not have risen. And so you get that imbalance with progesterone and estrogen. Really important to look at that. That's one of the main things we see uh, with female hormone imbalances. All right, but let's talk about a second symptom, which is water retention in the abdomen, women's breasts, as well as feeling a little bit more puffy overall. This can happen from a rise in or retention of sodium, the hormone imbalance itself, as well as what I want to talk about, differences in food cravings. So it's important to look at that because sometimes the body actually feels like it's craving saltier foods. And when we look at this imbalance to potassium, a woman might be holding on to more water because there might be a greater craving for those sodium-based foods. And higher sodium without a balance in potassium could lead to water retention. So I just wanted to share that. It's only one of the causes, but it's a possibility for sure. All right, the third one is this. 
there is an actual change, it can be a change when there are uh, hormonal imbalances in gastrointestinal activity. That means the actual progression, or what I like to call the intercessation of the intestines, the movement of digestion. So how well you're moving food out of the stomach and how well the food is moving or the, the digested food is moving through the bowels or the intestines. And when that's slow, you can get a greater feeling of fullness or bloating. And this often happens with the increase in progesterone around that day's 20, 21 or so. All right, we talked about the cravings. I wanna share with you how inflammation plays into this because this doesn't get talked about enough. So estrogen has pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory components to it. And it really depends on the level. So as estrogen starts to get too high, it can become pro-inflammatory and increase cytokines and prostaglandins, which I'll share with you in just a moment. It also matters estrogen's ratio to progesterone and the tissues that it may be affecting. So one of the things that we look for in our practice is the ratio. Now, post, we'll call it postmenopausal, we look for a ratio of about one unit, we're just gonna call it a unit of estrogen, to about 35 to 40 units of progesterone. So there's a specific ratio. The same goes though, premenstrual, except in a luteal phase, we want a much higher ratio. So let's say that a woman's estrogen production is about 1.5 units. We're looking at that to be about 200 of progesterone during peak luteal phase. And again, all of this is explained in the, stre- uh, explained in the stress minimum metabolism test, but I want to take you through it as to like what the background is. Now, when estrogen levels rise during the first half of that menstrual cycle, what can happen is right before ovulation, there can be a pro-inflammatory spike. And then post-ovulation, during the luteal phase, when progesterone levels increase, there can actually be a second wave of inflammation. But I want to share with you why, because there's two different reasons. One is estrogen dominance, if estrogen levels get too high. But the second is the actual uterine contractions. So it is the, the removal of that uterine lining that can increase prostaglandins, or actually said in a different way, prostaglandins, which are inflammatory cytokines, naturally increase when the uterine lining is being shed. And because of that, you get an increase in inflammation in the abdominal-based area. And oftentimes, the greater the shedding of that uterine lining, the greater the bloating can occur. So that's a little bit more advanced, but that is one more thing to look for. And again, we often see that with elevated levels of hormones. All right, number six is this. And it's tough not to talk about this when it can be such a big part of hormonal-based bloating, and that is the overall stress, cortisol production, when someone's not feeling well. So maybe they're not feeling well for other reasons. They have autoimmune issues, they have pain, they've got work stress, relationship stress, et cetera. But often when we see that, it lowers progesterone Estrogen levels can be totally normal, but progesterone levels come down, and it exacerbates everything that we just spoke about during the last five to 10 uh, days of a female cycle. All right, the uterine contractions we went over, but one of the things that I wanted to share with you is that it is often easy to pinpoint this because there can be greater amounts of cramping, and we can look at that as contractions, which also leads to abdominal bloating and inflammation, which pushes up on the stomach. So when we look at this, we can see that the gas may be more trapped, which I hear all the time in our practice, in a woman's intestines, small intestine, or, and or stomach. And so when the gas is trapped, oftentimes a woman will go for a walk, get moving a little bit, the gas will then begin to move, and they'll eliminate some of that bloating as well. So there are many different reasons. We gave you seven here today for hormonal-based bloating. What I want to do, though, is make it much easier next week. Now that you know the different reasons and that it's not all in your head, right? Like a lot of doctors like to say, we'll give you what to do in order to decrease and eliminate that bloating. If you want to see whether yours is estrogen-based, progesterone-based, or maybe a combination of the two, 
I would invite you to run what's called the stress moon and metabolism test. You can find that at stephencabral.com slash hormones dash test, or just on today's show notes, which is stephencabral.com slash 3098. And you can actually run it during your time of most symptoms during your cycle. And you'll be able to map out, is it high estrogen? Is it high progesterone? Is it both? Are both low? Is there an imbalance between estrogen and progesterone? How does cortisol play into this and much more? So again, you can check that out. All the show notes links will be at stephencabral.com slash 3098. Take care. Do make sure that you tune in, of course, each and every day to the Cabral concept, but next week for all of the fixes for these hormonal bloating-based issues. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning into today's show. Before you go, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I want to make sure that you're getting our daily content, not missing out on anything. Functional medicine, wellness, weight gain, weight loss, anti-aging, living longer, stronger, and all of the most cutting edge research. And if there's any topics you want to hear, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Take care.